if there's going to be any serious um, rapprochement between the United Kingdom and the European Union, that's got to be on a, a, an institutional lasting basis. And that's something which I suspect Starmer, like, like many British politicians, is reluctant to, to envisage. Uh, but I think he, he may come to understand that there's no alternative. Hello, I'm John Stevens. I'm the chair of the Federal Trust, and I'm talking once again to Brendan Donnelly, the director of the Federal Trust, about developments in the UK relating to Brexit. Brendan, we are now in a pre-election period in the UK, and the focus is on Keir Starmer, who it looks very likely will be the next prime minister. Pro-Europeans are somewhat concerned that he has been so cautious on the European question up until now and seems to be very determined to stick to that. Why is this, do you think? Well, I think he has a plan. And I think that Rishi Sunak spends a lot of time telling us he has a plan. But Starmer has a, an electoral plan, um, which is that he will win, and he hopes now to win with very substantial majority, uh, largely by reassuring those people who in the past were hesitant about, uh, about a, a Labour government, the prospect of a Labour government. Uh, an important element of that uh, reassuring rhetoric that he's employing uh, is on Europe. Um, no to rejoining, no to the single market, no to the customs union. Um, now, there is a view which says that, that he's taken this too far and it may even be counterproductive, um, but it's his plan and he's sticking with it. Uh, and there is a logic to it, um, but it's a, a logic which I think will create problems for him uh, once he is uh, elected to government. But do you think that pro-Europeans can be comforted to any degree by the thought that the larger the majority is, that Starmer is able to achieve over the Conservatives, and if the Conservatives suffer a truly crushing defeat, as may indeed be the case, that this will give him a greater room for manoeuvre in government on the European question, and indeed on all other questions? Uh, yes, I, 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 I think it may. Uh, but I think it, it, it'll be a, a couple of years before he's able to take advantage of that um, that potential flexibility. I think he's boxed himself in to such an extent but for the next couple of years, at least, he's going to have to confine himself um, simply to uh, smiling nicely at the, the Europeans um, and hoping um, that that will create a, a, a set of, of short term victories for the Labour Party in its European relations, uh, which, I, which I don't think will be achievable. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Labour government or the potential Labour government, Labour Party, used to talk about renegotiating the trade and cooperation agreement. Um, they've given that up because they realise that's uh, not a realistic prospect. Um, uh, I suspect, however, um, that in a couple of years' time, the mixture of public opinion turning even further against Brexit um, and the continuing economic problems of the country um, may create pressure on Starmer to have a, a, a more uh, accommodating and, and a more, in my view, realistic view of, uh, of, of relations with the European Union. Uh, but he is boxing himself into a corner in, in a way that, however big his majority in the short term, he, he won't be able to evade, eva evade or escape from immediately. How reliant will he be on a shift in public opinion, given the fact that he won't be apparently doing very much to guide that public opinion. Well, it is an extraordinary thing about um, Brexit and um, the developments over the past eight years um, that without leading political guidance from the Labour Party or the Liberal Democrats or, or anybody really, public opinion has spontaneously moved in, in the direction that it has. Um, and with the queues, which will inevitably incre be increasing with the greater formalities for, for imports, um, I, I, I just can't see that um, public opinion won't continue um, in that direction yet further. Will he also be relying on disarray in the opposition on this question, particularly if the Conservative Party moves, as many believe it will, to the right in having lost the election and take a more strongly anti-European stance? Will this be a limitation? Well, I, I think that that may be a, an encouragement for him. He, he may conclude, he may see, uh, because it's manifest, that the Conservative Party can't provide any effective opposition um, on Europe or anything else, um, and that will create opportunities for him. Uh, it will be up to him to decide whether, whether he, he takes those opportunities or not. And I think that's a, a, a rather unresolved question of British politics over the next five years. What about Starmer's own personal commitment to uh, the European 
issue uh, as a, a significant part of his political program. Um, he does seem to be someone with an almost limitless capacity for flexibility. I mean, the defection of of um, this um, lady from the Conservatives, um, Miss Elphick, seems to be rather a, a, a curious example of this. I mean, someone who one would not have thought would be a natural uh, move from the Conservatives to the Labour Party. And yet um, Starmer has, has uh, taken her on board without so much as a qualm. Well, it is possible to take comfort from that, that there's a, a sort of ruthless pragmatism about it, about him, that if in two years' time the mixture of a, a developing public opinion and economic um, mediocrity, economic stagnation, um, forces upon him a, a vote fuss, um, then he'll be able to do it, advocate that he is, um, with, with less uh, inhibitions and less um, uh, reservations um, that somebody uh, who's commitment to a particular political philosophy was was different and more more pronounced than than Starmer's. And will his position of power inside the Labour Party, having won such a significant victory, um, be such that he will be able to take his party with him, that he won't have any internal opposition to a more pro-European line? Um, I, I, I think that's right. I, I think his grip on, on the machine of the Labour Party is very, very strong indeed. And I think he'll be going with the flow of the Labour membership because uh, uh, there has been pressure, not as much as I would have liked, um, on him from within the Labour Party to adopt a, a more pro-EU stance. Um, they're, they're, he'll be going with the current um, if in two or three years' time he, he attempts to adopt and does adopt a, a more pro-EU stance. What about the EU's position on this? There was some commentary uh, recently that uh, the Labour Party would spend its first term in office getting to hate the EU because it would not be able to get the concessions that it was hoping for and not have the welcoming hand that it was uh, feeling entitled to. Uh, where does the EU stand? And in particular, where do you think they would uh, be regarding a UK application to rejoin, for example, the single market or the customs union? It is a possible outcome that the Labour Party in five years' time would be resentful, uh, simply resentful of the EU's um, uh, refusal to, to, to accept as, as hard currency um, smiles and uh, warm words. Uh, but it needn't work out that way. Um, what I'm hypothesizing is that uh, halfway through the next, uh, through the future Starmer government, there will be some sort of vote for some sort of, of, of change of mind. Um, the recognition that um, simply um, smiling sweetly is not going to cut it with the, with the European Union. The U European Union is in its external relations, a much more hard-headed actor than, than sometimes people in, the, in this country understand. Uh, I'm not sure, and I don't think the European Union is sure, what its reaction would be um, to a, an application to join the single market, however that was phrased. Um, there would certainly be people within the European Union who said, we mustn't allow the British to cherry pick. Um, and there would be certainly people within the European Union who said, um, is there any point in having um, a, 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 a protracted negotiation with the British on this subject, um, only for them to be um, whipped out uh, of the single market or customs union or whatever it was um, by the next Conservative government. Uh, I, th I think there's an interaction between internal British politics and the reaction that we'd get from the European Union to any attempts institutionally to come, to come closer. Uh, I think one thing that the European Union will want in its uh, from a, a, a Labour government in future is that if there's going to be any serious um, a rapprochement between the United Kingdom and the European Union, that's got to be on a, a, an institutional lasting basis. And that's something which I suspect Starmer, Starmer like, like many British politicians, um, is, is reluctant to, to, to envisage. Uh, but I think he, he may come to understand that there's no alternative. And public opinion may come to understand in this country that there's no alternative. But even with public opinion moving strongly towards the position that Brexit was a mistake, uh, an application to join the single market uh, without going further, uh, being therefore a rule taker, is quite a hurdle for British public opinion, one would have thought, especially if there hasn't been any real preparatory work uh, in engaging with public opinion on 
the European issue in general and on that specific proposition. Uh, that that's absolutely true. But but if you had a government with with a formidable advocate, which he can be when he wants to be, um, in in Starmer um, of um, uh, reversing Brexit of. of correcting the mistake that has been made under the influence of a concern and carelessness of a conservative government um, then i think that that is a, a change of opinion that that could could come about uh, in 2016 the conservative government which in theory was in favor of remaining in the european union um, had the problem that it had spent six years um, decrying everything about the european union uh, if you have a government um, which is consistently and enthusiastically pointing um, policy in a particular direction, uh, it, it is possible to go with the flow of public opinion um, and uh, make important changes, not overnight, um, but over a period of time of, say, a year or 18 months. I, I, I don't think that's a, an impossible hurdle to uh, overcome. Uh, if um, the question of being a, a rule taker within the European Union is taken in isolation, then, then of course it's a problem, which is why I think that thinking about joining the single current market or customs union without regarding it as a prelude to rejoining fully the European Union makes very little political or, or economic sense. So you would see that it would be necessary for uh, the government, the UK government, to present single market and customs union membership as a step towards fully rejoining. Yes, and I think that's a coherent case that can be made. And that finesses the problems about being a, a rule taker, because you're not going to be a rule taker indefinitely. Uh, uh, the thought that we can get back into the European Union through the back door of the single market, um, I, I think is to repeat the errors of, um, of, of the first 15 years of, of this century. Um, that somehow you can become a, a, a member of the European Union, a full member of the European Union by stealth. Um, I'm, I'm, it hasn't worked. It didn't work in 2016. Um, and I think that there, there is justice in the claim that some of the people who advocated or even still advocate British membership of the European Union um, aren't um, on the level with the, with the electorate uh, about the sovereignty sharing and institutional implications of all that. But is it not clear that to fully rejoin the EU, the UK would now obviously not have the opt-outs it previously enjoyed and would have to be committed to joining the euro and Schengen at the very least? Uh, yes. Uh, and I think that uh, if you had a government that was making the case for those things, particularly on Schengen, and particularly with the difficulties that are increasingly facing British travellers to continental Europe, um, that wouldn't be a, an impossible sell. Uh, of course, if you present it in terms of uh, we have to give up the power, we have to give up our passports, we have to give up this, that and the other, uh, then that's not the way in which you're going to win the electorate over. Uh, but if you can spend a period of time uh, at a governmental level with all the resources of government making the case for being in the euro, be, make, making the case for being in Schengen, uh, then I don't think either of those things are, are, are impossible uh, to convince the, the electorate of. One important point about rejoining and the prospect of rejoining is that our European partners will want to be convinced that, that this isn't going to be undone. In, in five years' time by a Conservative government. So it, it will be important um, uh, how British politics develop for po prospects uh, uh, of rejoining uh, and uh, not insisting on opt-outs of single currency of, of Schengen uh, will be a sign of, of good faith to our to our community partners, to our European partners, uh, that this time we're serious about being in, in the European Union. Uh, and of course, practically and pragmatically, being in the euro in particular makes it much more difficult to unpick European membership, EU membership in future. But this requires an enormous amount of bandwidth for a government to undertake. And one of the curious phenomena at the moment is that we have this very significant shift of uh, public opinion against Brexit. And yet Europe um, and Brexit does not feature very highly in the list of concerns that people have, certainly ahead of the general election. They're thinking about the economy, they're thinking about the cost of living, the National Health Service, immigration. Uh, now, of course, all these issues have a European dimension, a very significant one. Uh, and yet, 
the European question is submerged by these other questions. Might not a, a Labour government wrestling with these issues, wrestling with the economy, wrestling with the cost of living, housing and the rest, um, still be so focused on, on that level that they're unable to make the further step uh, of linking it to a programme of rejoining the EU? Or will they actually find a programme for rejoining the EU, a way of creating a general narrative for their tackling of those issues, one that is obviously superior to whatever is being offered at the time by what is constituting the opposition. Well, that's the optimistic uh, analysis, and I, I don't think by any means it's impossible. Um, I come back to the point that when you have all the resources of government, a particular government which will be politically dominant, as the Labour Party seems likely to be for the next five years, arguing a particular case and a particular coherent and um, narrative-driven case, uh, then I, I think public opinion can be can be shifted. And and in this case, it wouldn't so much be shifted as, as complemented, as filled in, uh, as consolidated, if, if there is profound and growing antagonism to Brexit, um, then then that seems to me a rather ripe field, a, a rather fertile field um, on which the Labour Party and the Labour government could, could scatter its rhetoric uh, about not just rhetoric, its analysis about the way in which rejoining the EU, uh, becoming more economically associated with the EU, um, would be a, a, a major contribution to solving all these problems. So in conclusion, you would say that it is possible to envisage at the next general election, the one after this, a Labour government effectively advocating rejoining the European Union. That, that is not a fantastical proposition. It is actually one in which pro-Europeans could uh, take some comfort. Uh, yes, I, I, th I think it is a possibility. I 50-50, 60-40, who knows? But it's certainly not so far from reality um, that those who want to rejoin the European Union should give up in despair and say, well, we're, we're, we're never going to achieve it. it. It is something that's on the cards. Uh, and it's something that the, the Labour government is much more likely to do um, if people begin to say, uh, we will not vote for a Labour party that doesn't go down this road. Um, at the moment, the Labour Party think, and probably rightly, that they can largely get away um, with offending those people who want to rejoin the European Union. Um, over the next five years, um, it will be very interesting to see whether political forces um, that, that want to rejoin the European Union uh, are able to mobilise and put pressure on the Labour Party in a way that they, they, they certainly haven't until now. Um, and, and some of them, in my view, don't realise uh, how important and urgent it will be to put that pressure uh, on the Labour Party if it does get into government. Um, I think from, from day one, those who want to rejoin the European Union uh, have an opportunity to put pressure on the Labour Party, um, but it, it, it will require pressure, it will require insistence, um, and there'll be a temptation to say the Labour government know what they're doing. Um, I think under the pressure of events, uh, they may well swivel in a more pro rejoin direction, um, but it will be the pressure of events combined with uh, increasing public uh, um, political pressure on them as well. well. I think that's a very good place to conclude, Brendan. Let's hope that the Federal Trust can play a part in putting that pressure on a future Labour government. Many thanks, and I, I hope uh, you enjoyed this video and we'll follow our others on the same topic. Thanks very much.